Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Drunken Muscles. That's right, I like my shellfish like I like my sailors. And this is one of the easiest shellfish recipes ever. And once you have your ingredients together, this thing takes about 10 minutes start to finish. So here's how you do it. The first and most important ingredient, of course, is the mussels. These are from Prince Edward Island. You'll see them in the seafood case, it'll say PEI. They should be incredibly fresh. They need to be scrubbed really well and rinsed off. And if you see any of those little beards attached, pull it off. Mine really didn't have any. Mine were pretty clean. And as far as portioning, I usually go with like about a pound of mussels per person. All right? So our mussels are set. On to the rest of the ingredients. So I'm going to need you to mince up some garlic. You can use regular garlic, but you know what? I found some green garlic in the market, and I decided to use that. So just like using green onions, I'm pretty much going to use the white and light parts, and I'm going to mince it up nice and fine. And again, don't feel bad if you don't find green garlic. Regular garlic works extraordinarily well and is incredibly delicious, so don't even worry about it, okay? This is one of those recipes that's super easy, but you need to get all your ingredients prepped ahead of time, which is called, of course, mise en place, okay? So our garlic's ready. We're going to set that aside. Next, we're going to do some Italian parsley, and you know my method for this. You hold the stems, you hold your knife, a sharp knife, at a 45-degree angle, and you just shave off all the leaves. So easy. Do not pick parsley leaves off the stems. It takes too long. All right. And once we've done that, we just give it a chop. Not too fine. All right. Something like that. And other than a little bit of lemon zest and red pepper flakes, that's about it. All right. So we're going to head over to the stove where you need a stock pot like this with a tight fitting lid. All right. Very, very important. So make sure you have that before you even think of starting this recipe. We're going to throw in a chunk of butter. I'm going to put that on medium heat. And once it melts, we're going to add our garlic. We're going to give that about a 30 second sizzle after which I'm gonna add my red pepper flakes. I like this a little bit spicy, but you know I like most things a little bit spicy. So I'm gonna add a big pinch of those, give that about 15 seconds in the butter. At that point, I'm gonna add my lemon zest. I used a zester to get those nice thin strands. You could also grate it on the microplane. You've seen us do both many times. So the lemon zest goes in, you give that about 30 seconds, and then quickly pour in your wine. Okay, the wine stops the cooking. We do not want to burn or brown the garlic. So that whole process of sauteing the garlic, the pepper, and the lemon zest only took about a minute. Once the wine's in, I give it a few turns of freshly ground black pepper. You generally don't need salt. The mussels have enough natural salts, so be careful when seasoning. And at that point, our drunken mussel broth is ready. We're going to place on the lid, we're going to turn the heat to high, and we're going to bring this to a boil. As soon as it boils, you're going to quickly throw in your mussels. Don't throw any of the ice in. If you had them sitting in water or something like that, you want to drain it. You just want the mussels. You're going to quickly place the lid back on. And by the way, I'm so glad I wore a shirt for this video. Generally, I cook topless. All right, so the lid's on. We're going to give the pot the old shake a shake and let it sit there undisturbed for exactly one minute. After one minute, remove the lid, take a spoon, and give it a quick stir, just like that, a couple turns. Place the lid back on and wait two minutes, after which you should be getting close. You're going to see lots of the shells opening. In fact, back right, you can actually see it opening. So cool. At that point, we're going to dump in our Italian parsley, give it another stir, put the lid back on, and as soon as those shells are open, you're done. It might take another minute. It might take another two minutes. It could take possibly one and a half minutes or three minutes. The point is, who knows? Go by sight. When it looks like they're all open, you're done. All right, the shell should be open like that. The muscles should still be huge and plump and gorgeous and not shriveled and pathetic. All right, the only way to screw this recipe up is to keep boiling these after they open. And of course, if there's a couple that don't open, that's not so unusual. Just throw those away and deal with the good ones. Okay, to serve, you're going to want to transfer those into a big wide bowl. Of course, you're going to ladle over copious amounts of that amazing drunken muscle broth. I highly suggest you serve it with some lemon and some grilled bread. Of course, if you're having grill problems, I feel bad for you, son, but you can just use a toaster instead. And that's it. Drunken mussels. How fast and easy was that? And of course, drunken mussels is just a generic term for mussels steamed in any kind of alcoholic beverage. I've done this with beer, with things like sherry. Of course, you don't have to use alcohol. You could use some clam juice or just some water. Is it as good? Of course not. Not even close. All right, so let me dig in here. I'm going to take my freakishly small metal fork and dip that mussel in that amazing broth. Garlicky, spicy, lemony. Just unbelievable. And while dipping the mussel in that broth is pretty awesome, nothing compares to how awesome dipping the bread in there is. It's just spectacular. 
And if you're feeling extra sexy, I like to place it on the bread and drizzle some of that buttery, garlicky wine broth over. It's just a very special experience that I hope you experience especially. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Crispy beer batter fish and chips. That's right, anybody can do a beer batter fish that stays crispy for a few minutes. But I'm sorry, for me that is just not long enough. Okay, not to sound too high maintenance, but I kind of want my crispy fried fish to stay crispy throughout the entire eating process. And by the way, it's always a nice thing when the recipe that provides the best results also just happens to be the easiest recipe, which is the case here. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our batter. And that's going to begin with one cup of self-rising flour, which is nothing more than regular flour that's milled with baking powder and salt. And as usual, I will tell you how to mix up your own in the blog post, which is super easy and only takes a second. And then to this flour, we're also going to add about two tablespoons of rice flour. Or if you want, some other kind of non-wheat flour. Okay, some people like cornstarch, some people like potato starch, which will also work, but I like the rice flour. And then last but not least, I'm also going to add in a little extra touch of baking powder. And even though our self-rising flour already contains baking powder, I do like to add just a little bit more. And that's it, we'll take a whisk and give this a mix until we have everything thoroughly combined. And that is now ready to finish off by stirring in our beer. Which, by the way, I'm going to wait to do until I'm ready to use this. And because one of the secrets here is keeping the batter as cold as possible, what we'll do is transfer these dry ingredients into the freezer, and we'll leave this in there until we're ready to mix in our beer. And then once that's set, we can move on to prep our fish. And today I'll be using some beautiful frozen cod, which I gently defrosted overnight in the fridge. And if we are going to use frozen fish, or any fish for that matter, we want to make sure to get it as dry as possible. Okay, so use some paper towels and blot off any excess moisture. And then what we'll do once our fish has been thawed and dried is possibly cut it down the middle to make two approximately one inch thick strips. And sure, we could have just fried this as is, but by cutting it, not only will it cook faster, but we're also increasing our surface area, which means that much more crispy coating. And then what we'll do once that's cut is go ahead and douse those in a little bit of seasoned rice flour before they go in the batter. And what this is going to do is absorb any of that last moisture on the surface. And then once that's been lightly dusted and we shake off the excess, what we'll do is transfer it onto some crinkled up foil. And this is just going to serve as sort of a drying rack for that fish. Okay, so that's going to let some air circulate underneath. And we will have less chance of a soggy bottom. Oh, by the way, I'm just seasoning with a little bit of salt. But if you did want to sneak in some spices, like curry powder, chili powder, etc., this would be a great step to do that. But anyway, we'll go ahead and dust our fish in the rice flour, along with, like I said, any other seasonings we want. And then because we want to keep everything cold, we'll transfer that into the fridge until we're ready to use it. And that's it. Once our fish is prepped and our oil's hot, we can pull our dry ingredients out of the freezer and finish this batter off by pouring in some beer. And for this, I recommend a nice inexpensive lager style. Okay, I have one imported from Australia in large blue cans. But really, any cheap lager is going to work. And that's because your more affordable canned beers are going to be nice and light in color and taste, not to mention have a nice high level of carbonation. And all we're going to do is whisk in enough until it's as thick or as thin as we want. Okay, so I'll start with a nice big splash, and I'll give it a stir. And then I'll decide if I need more, which I did. And what I'm going for is something similar to a nice thick pancake batter. All right, keep in mind, the thicker the batter, the thicker the coating once it's fried. And since personally I want a nice thin crispy coating, I tend to go for a thinner batter. And I'm actually going to grab a spoon so you can get a good look at what I'm talking about. Okay, so make it thicker if you want. But I generally shoot for something that's just going to coat the fish. And by the way, I mentioned keeping everything cold is a key. So if you're not going to use this right away, pop it in the fridge or keep it on a bowl of ice. But I was starving and ready to fry. So I'm going to transfer in two pieces of my nice cold dry fish into the batter. And then once those are nicely coated, we'll go ahead and lift them out letting most but not all of the batter drip off, at which point we will carefully transfer that into some 375 degree oil. And by the way, I did that first piece wrong, because we don't want the oil splashing towards us. So place it in like this, so it splashes away from you. And then what we'll do after making sure those aren't sticking together, is let them fry for about three to four minutes, or until they're crispy and beautifully golden brown. And there are some things we deep fry, 
that about halfway through we can kind of tip them and flip them over, but fried fish isn't really one of them. So don't worry about trying to turn them over. They can just cook with that same side down. Although sometimes to hedge my bets, I will give them a little dunking for a few seconds. But anyway, like I said, we'll let those go for about three or four minutes, or until they look a little something like this, at which point we'll fish those out and let those drain for a few seconds on some paper towel. And as you can hopefully see, this recipe really does produce a gorgeous piece of fried fish, which we will want to serve immediately, on top of either some french fries, which people in certain places call chips, or on real actual chips. And as you can see, I've lined the bowl with some newspaper, and a little bit of an homage to actual fish and chips. Speaking of which, because malt vinegar is often served with the fried fish, I actually went with salt and vinegar potato chips. And that's it, before I tuck in, I went ahead and tucked in a little bit of tartar sauce and a wedge of lemon, which is not traditional with regular fish and chips, but is very, very, very traditional with Western New York fish fries, which is what I like to pretend this is. And by the time I did that, it had been about 10 minutes since this came out of the fryer, but it was still crispy, as you'll hear when I bite. Oh yeah. And what I find amazing with this recipe is that we've achieved this level of crispiness with such an incredibly thin coating. I mean, it's barely there. In fact, this might even qualify as a low-carb recipe. Oh, and by the way, as I was taking this next bite, I thought to myself, I'm going to stop and take some pictures of the cross-section, which is why you're about to see me pinch off a jagged piece of the coating, which as I was doing, I realized would look weird on camera. So just something I wanted to mention, because that would have kept a few people up wondering, why did he pinch that fish stick? And of course, it's probably really obvious, but I'll tell you anyway. Just because I use cod for this doesn't mean you have to. I mean, you are after all the Arthur creatures, of what sea creatures this features. And virtually any fish or seafood will work with this technique. But anyway, I went ahead and finished that first piece. And I went ahead and grabbed the second. And even though it had been quite a while since this came out of the fryer, it was still just as crispy as my first bite. So I just absolutely love this formula. Oh, and let me give you a little tip here. Whether you're going to use a tartar sauce or some other sauce, you want to go ahead and apply that to each bite. All right, don't just slop it all on there at once. Otherwise, everything's going to get soggy. All right, so the method we want to use is the bite sauce, bite sauce, bite sauce. Whoops, sorry, it's actually the other way around. It's sauce bite, sauce bite, sauce bite. And that will help preserve the crispiness. But anyway, that's it. My favorite method for doing beer-battered fish. Whether you're going to serve yours on regular chips or the British-style potato chips, which are actually French fries, which are really actually Belgian fries. But the point is, no matter what you serve this on, I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Lobster bisque! That's right, this has been on the list for a long time, and there is really no better special occasion soup than lobster bisque. And while it's not very hard to make, there are a few steps involved, the first of which entails sending a couple crustaceans to lobster heaven. We're going to take two lobsters. I like to use these smaller lobsters, like one and a quarter to one and a half pound. For lobster bisque, two small lobsters is always better than one big lobster. Now, many say lobsters can't feel any pain, but I don't like to take any chances, so I put these in the freezer for a half hour before I did this to basically knock them out cold. So we're going to take a sharp knife, and I'm going to cut right through the head, right between the eyes, all the way through. I'm going to turn it and cut it down the back like that, right through the tail, and there is your halved lobster. Okay, once the lobster split, we have to remove the stomach. So I'm just going to take my tongs and pull out that sack. It very well may have a bunch of sandy-looking, gunky stuff like you see here. Oops, if anything falls out, make sure you get it. Oops, that's not it. There we go. Once you've removed the stomach sack from the head, we're going to break this up in pieces. We're going to pull off the claws. I'm going to cut the tail off. You can do this with your hands, but because I'm operating a camera, I'm using scissors here. I like to cut the legs like that. You're definitely going to want to crack the claws. Do that under a towel. I just use the back of a knife. You can use a rolling pin or a meat pounder. All right, but use a towel. Otherwise, it's going to splash everywhere. Same for the knuckles. Go ahead and crack those. And I'll put a link on Food Wishes that shows this in more detail. But once you've cut and cracked your two lobsters, we're going to throw those in a roasting pan with a little bit of celery and onion. And we're going to throw that in a hot oven, 400 degrees, for about 15 or 20 minutes until it's nicely roasted. The shells are going to turn that beautiful rusty red color. And then we're going to transfer all of this into your stock pot except for those tail pieces. Save those four tail halves. I'll show you what to do with those in a minute. 
All right. But everything besides the tails can go in a large stock pot. See that large one. All right. At least six quarts. So you have plenty of room to work. And then we're going to add a splash of water to the roasting pan. I'm going to put that on like medium high heat and just give it about two or three minutes to deglaze the bottom. We want every available molecule of lobster flavor. So once all that stuff comes up off the bottom, we're going to go ahead and pour that into the stock pot. And then I'm going to add enough water to make three quarts total. All right, so I deglaze with a couple cups, and then I added the rest to make three quarts of cold water. I'm going to add a few garlic cloves, a few sprigs of fresh thyme, and a bay leaf. I want you to put that on medium-high heat and bring that up to a simmer. Okay, now that's going to take a couple minutes. While we're doing that, let's go ahead and pull the meat from the tails and just wrap that up and reserve it. We will put that back in the soup later, of course. Okay, so meat goes in the fridge, lobster tail shells go back in the stock. And like I said, you want to bring that up to a simmer. And of course, like almost all stocks, as soon as it starts to boil, I want you to back the heat down to low and just simmer gently for 40 minutes. This is not a stock that simmers a long time. In fact, many people think the flavor deteriorates if you cook it over that amount of time. So about 40 minutes later, my stock looked like this. We're going to go ahead and take a strainer and remove that into a colander. All right, you definitely want to bowl under that colander. Every drop of that juice is precious, okay? So we'll dump that juice back in our stock. And then when it's cool enough to handle, pick out all the meat you can. Most of it's going to come from the claws and the knuckles. You can use a nutcracker or cut it open with scissors, but try to get every tiny scrap you can. And we'll refrigerate that along with our tail meat for later. I said every tiny scrap. There you go. All right, once the meat's picked... And any reserved liquid that dripped through that colander is poured back in the stock pot. We're going to go ahead and add one cup of crushed tomatoes. I'm using San Marzano. And we're also going to fortify that with a little bit of tomato paste. I'm also going to add a couple teaspoons of paprika. No, that's not cayenne, so don't get all excited. Give that a stir and bring that up to a simmer over medium-high heat. And as soon as that comes up to a simmer, I'm going to add some long-grain rice. Traditionally, bisque is thickened with rice, not a roux. So after I put that in, I'm going to turn the heat down to medium. And we're going to simmer that for about 30 minutes or until the rice completely cooks and starts to fall apart. The rice has to be absolutely soft. All right. And how you know if you can smash it against the side of the pot like that, it's done. At that point, turn off your heat and we're going to blend this completely smooth. I'm using an immersion blender. A stick blender it works great. You can use a regular blender, of course. And you can see that rice just gives it the most awesome, luxurious, beautiful texture you're ever going to taste in a soup. And personally, I'd be totally happy just eating that, but this gets way better. So what we're going to do at this point, we're going to add some brandy. And I don't want you to use good brandy. I want you to use cheap brandy. Ask your local wino what they drink and use that. By the way, do not tell them you're making lobster bisque. That would just be mean. All right, so some brandy, a big splash of heavy cream, a few drops of Worcestershire sauce, a nice big shake of cayenne pepper. This soup should definitely have a little heat involved. All right, we're going to stir that in. And now we need to simmer this for about 10 to 15 minutes to cook out that raw alcohol flavor in the brandy. And you want to be careful. My heat's on about medium, maybe just over medium. And you want to take a spatula and you want to make sure it's not sticking to the bottom because it is thick now. It could scorch if you don't pay attention. So you don't want to have it simmering any more than that, just a gentle simmer. And once that's simmered for about 10 or 15 minutes, just like that, nice and gently, we're going to go ahead and chop up our reserved lobster meat. Now you can really mince this fine. Some people like it like almost pureed. Other people like it in big chunks. That's up to you. You're the boss of your bisque. I like to do mine in the middle somewhere. We're going to go ahead and toss that lobster in. We're going to reduce the heat to low. And once that's heated through and seasoned, you're done. So give it a taste. Mine needed just a touch more cayenne and some salt, and that is ready to serve. I'm going to ladle that up. I'm going to garnish with just a few extra drops of whipped cream. I'm going to swirl it into the shape of the Constellation Crab Nebula, because there is no lobster nebula. A little more cayenne. And then, instead of parsley or chive, I went with some freshly chopped tarragon, which has a beautiful kind of anisette flavor. Works perfectly with this soup. And that's it. Lobster bisque. That is a gorgeous looking bowl of soup. Even you people that don't think anything looks good have to admit, that looks pretty good. And how does it taste? It's almost beyond description. All right, a proper lobster bisque should taste more like lobster than lobster. And if that sounds impossible, you've never made lobster bisque, because it's true. Okay? So I really, really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy. 
Spanish octopus. That's right, not only is this recipe Spanish, but the actual octopus I used was Spanish as well. Which is great because as far as I'm concerned, you can never have too much Spanish involved in a recipe. Those people know how to eat. And what I find most surprising about octopus, besides that it's not more popular, is just how many tips and tricks exist for how to cook it tender. Which I really don't understand because if you just simply braise it until it's tender, you don't need any tricks or tips. So that's gonna be our approach. And we'll begin by putting together our very simple braising liquid. So into the saucepan, we will toss in one chopped Spanish onion, also known as your common yellow onion from the market. We'll also toss in three or four peeled and slightly crushed garlic cloves, as well as a couple bay leaves, and a nice generous spoon of Spanish paprika. And then we'll finish this off with a nice big pinch of salt, as well as a healthy drizzle of olive oil, extra credit if it's Spanish. And then what we're gonna do is turn our heat on to medium high and cook this mixture stirring occasionally for about five minutes or so, or just until those onions start to soften up and kind of turn translucent. And then once that happens, we will introduce our one and only braising liquid here, a relatively small amount of white wine. And as usual, I always say use something drinkable. And while that's partially because we want something decent in the recipe, but more importantly, it's because we're gonna to need to drink the rest of the bottle. So as always, nothing sold by the name cooking wine should be used. And what we'll do is stir that in and wait for it to come up to a simmer. And as soon as it does, our brazen liquid is now ready for the octopus. And there's mine. That is a one pound piece of Spanish octopus. And by piece, I mean arm. Or is it leg? You know, let's go with appendage. And in case you're wondering, that is almost always imported frozen and then thawed before being sold. And what we'll do is go ahead and transfer that into our brazen liquid. And we'll sort of toss it around to get it acquainted with all the other ingredients. And what we'll do once that's been accomplished is simply turn our heat to low and then cook this covered for about an hour or so or until it's tender. And that's it. It really is that simple. We did not beat the octopus on a rock before we put it in here, nor are we going to add wine corks or any of the other crazy tricks people do. If we simply cook this gently using this shallow braise method, eventually it will get just as tender as we want which by the way is somewhere between rubbery and mushy. And the only other thing I like to do is about halfway through, after about 20 or 30 minutes, I like to uncover it and turn it over, because as you can see, it's not fully submerged in the liquid. So we'll give that a flip, and then we'll cover that back up and simply continue braising until it's exactly as tender as we want. And as usual, the only way to know that is by giving it the old polka polka. And for that testing, you probably should really use a small sharp knife versus this wooden skewer I used. Since for whatever reason, the texture of the octopus really seems to grab onto that wooden skewer. It makes it look and feel like it's a lot tougher than it is. But anyway, I did give it a test and determined it needed to cook for a little bit longer. And by the way, like most recipes where I give it time, please only use that as a rough guide and test for yourself. Okay, you are after all the Poseidon of Deciden when this is done. And depending on the size and quantity of the octopus you're using, this could take a lot less or a lot more time. But as I mentioned, mine ended up taking about an hour. Although you really couldn't tell by watching this test, since it looks super tough. But it really wasn't. I could tell that meat was just tender, which is why I turned off the heat and transferred that into a bowl. And I should mention, if you're the kind of person that would get concerned about a slimy purple skin, don't be. That's totally normal. And we're going to wipe off most of that when this is cold anyway. Speaking of which, you can eat this right away, but I think it's actually better if we let this cool in its own juices, which is why I'm gonna pour those over and then sort of spoon it over the octopus for no apparent reason. And then once this is cooled down, I'll wrap it up and pop it in the fridge until thoroughly chilled or even better overnight. And even though people keep telling me I can put warm things in the fridge, I guess old habits die hard. So I did place this on an ice bath to cool down a little quicker, at which point I did in fact wrap it up and leave it overnight. So yes, if you want this today, make sure you start it yesterday. And then what we'll do once we're ready for final service is go ahead and unwrap it and pull it out of that relatively disgusting looking mixture, which you definitely don't want to throw away because what we'll do is bring that to a boil and strain it and use that as a base for our sauce. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because first we have to prep and then sear slash char the surface of this octopus. So what we'll do first is take a paper towel and wipe off as much of that purple slimy skin as we want which is probably almost all of it. And I actually did do a little more than I'm showing here, since you really can only watch so much of this kind of thing. But anyway, we'll go ahead and de-slimify the surface 
and then cut this into three or four smaller, easier to work with pieces. And even though I'm about to sear this for this recipe, if you want, you can eat this cold by slicing it thin and using it in some kind of composed salad. And after all these years, I still haven't decided whether I like it better this way or hot. It really is amazing done both ways. So if you do want to serve this chilled, just slice it thin and dress it as you see fit. And even without a dressing, that was so delicious, I almost stopped and ate the rest. It really was fantastic. But I resisted and went ahead and finished cleaning those up, at which point I gave them a little brushing with olive oil. And you could, if you want, give them a little sprinkling of salt. But those cold pieces I just tasted seem to be seasoned perfectly. So I'm just going to simply brush them with olive oil. At which point we want to sear these very aggressively in a very hot pan or equally hot grill pan. And for me, if you have one, one of these panini presses work perfectly. Okay, thanks to that weight on top, we're going to get a beautiful sear and a gorgeous caramelization bordering on chard, which is not a mistake. That really is how far you want to go. Which reminds me, this stuff is perfect outside on your charcoal grill. But anyway, what we're going to do is sear those for three or four minutes per side, or until the outside looks like this. And of course, since I really like to play with my food, once both sides have been nicely caramelized, I generally just sort of toss them around until I'm satisfied those are heated through, at which point we will pull those off and move into final plating. So what we'll do is set that aside for just a minute while we make our sauce, which I guess is more of a dressing. And to make that, we'll take some of our boiled strained braising liquid and add some freshly squeezed lemon juice, a little bit of olive oil, and some freshly chopped Italian parsley. And by the way, you see how that whisk is blocking the shot? That's the reason I have not won a James Beard Award yet. I mean, there's other reasons, but that's one of them. But anyway, we'll whisk that together and check for seasoning, which mine didn't need because that liquid was already so flavorful. And once that's set, we can go ahead and slice up our octopus into some smaller, more attractive pieces. And I went ahead and served that on some beautiful, crusty roasted potatoes. And then we'll finish this up by spooning over our sauce. And by the way, if you don't feel like boiling and straining that braising liquid, this is still going to be great with just olive oil and lemon juice. But using some of those reserved cooking liquids really does elevate this dish. And then to make this official, we'll dust it with a little bit of cayenne, as well as a possibly gratuitous parsley sprig. And that's it. What I'm calling Spanish octopus is done. And above and beyond the hopefully perfectly tender texture, the flavor of octopus is surprisingly mild and meaty. Or if you've never had it before, I guess it's similar to calamari. But for me, a little bit sweeter and a little bit richer. But that could be just because we're biting into a bigger piece of it versus those little skinny rings. But anyway, just an absolutely delicious thing to eat. Plus, it has suction cups on it. So you got that going for you, which is nice. Oh, and I'm not exactly sure why potatoes are such a perfect combo with octopus. But they are. Just an amazing pairing. And as awesome as those big chunks of octopus are, the smaller, skinnier, even more caramelized pieces might be even more enjoyable. If I can get it on the fork. See, it knows we're talking about it. There we go. But anyway, that's it. How I do Spanish octopus. You don't really need any secret tips and tricks. Just cook it till it's tender, sear it on a hot pan or grill, and enjoy one of the world's most underappreciated foods. I mean, come on, why isn't this on every menu? Probably the suction cups. But anyway, if you can find some Spanish octopus, which you can, I really hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Salmon and parchment. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to cook fish encased in paper. It is a really cool trick, relatively easy, visually exciting, and that's about it. All right, to do this, the most important thing you need is this large baker's parchment paper. This is the full size sheet pan size, all right? You can buy rolls at the grocery store, but this is much easier to use. And if you read the blog post, I'm gonna give you a couple secrets of where you can find that stuff, possibly for free. All right, so I have two sheets. I'm gonna fold those in half. I'm gonna crease it right there. And once it's folded in half, I'm gonna take the side that has the fold and I'm gonna take scissors and I'm gonna cut like a half circle. So just like when you were a kid and you used to fold a piece of paper in half and cut the heart shape, that's all you're doing here. So I'm gonna start off in a general circle shape and then I'm gonna kind of taper it down when I get to the bottom like that. And you can rewind this and check it out. But when you unfold it, you should have basically a heart shape. 
And you can see we're gonna have plenty of room to place our fish and vegetables in there. All right, after your parchment paper is cut, I'm gonna drizzle mine with some oil. I'm using olive oil, any oil will work. You can even use butter. And you're gonna cover that thing completely. I flipped it over, I spread it on the other side, and that is ready to go. Okay, at that point, I'm gonna place down my eight ounce salmon center cut filet. I'm gonna place it in the middle just past the fold, and you'll be able to see the exact position when I pan out. And the beauty of a parchment cooked piece of fish, you can put your vegetable and side dish right in there. So I have some blanched asparagus, I have some boiled potatoes. The asparagus I just boiled for one minute, just to give them a little head start. All right, then you're gonna season it. You can use anything you want. Guess what I used? That's right. I had some pastrami dry rub left over. Beautiful on salmon. All right, so I want you to throw down some spices. I want you to salt it generously. And if you have fresh herbs, throw them in. This is a magnificent technique for fresh herbs. All right, I didn't have anything. Actually, that's not true. I had some thyme, but I didn't feel like thyme. In fact, I didn't even feel like making a thyme pun. And then last but not least, I'm gonna give mine just a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. And then right here, when we pan out, you can see the exact position. So like I said, the salmon's basically in the middle of the half circle, right next to the fold. All right, we're gonna fold over the other half and then the crimping and the pressing begins. So we're gonna start the folding on the left, what we're gonna call the rounded side, and we're gonna end up at the pointier side. So this is not complicated, but I want you to go slow and just fold up about a half inch to an inch of paper and crease it really tightly, and then grab some more about an inch away, fold that over, give it a really, really firm crease. So you're gonna keep overlapping and folding, creasing, overlap, fold, crease, overlap, fold, crease. Remember, this has to hold air. So you really wanna get it nice and tight. And the reason we started on the rounder end is because when we get to that pointy end, I want a lot of extra paper to seal it. So we're gonna keep crimping and folding and folding and creasing and crimping. And you should have a decent amount of extra parchment, as you can see there. I want you to make three or four final folds really, really firmly pressed and creased. And then that little inch or two left over, crease it firmly and tuck it under. And that will, I promise, hold in the air. Once that's prepped, we're gonna throw it on a sheet pan. And by the way, those of you that requested close-ups of my hairy hand, there you go. You're welcome. All right, so that's ready for the oven. You can see I did two. We're gonna pop those in the center of a preheated 400 degree oven for 15 minutes and they're gonna puff up and it's gonna be spectacular. And of course I did something you never wanna do, never open the oven while they're cooking, but I had to get a shot. Look at that. All right, 15 minutes later I pulled them out and as soon as you pull them out, that's what's gonna happen. They deflate. They deflate faster than a Cubs fan's hopes after the first week of the season. Now after 15 minutes with a piece of salmon that big, it's probably still a little medium rare inside, but you're gonna let this sit for five minutes. It's gonna continue to steam and cook in that parchment. And five minutes later, you're gonna have a moist, delicious, amazing, amazing salmon dinner. Now for service, you can just unwrap this and start eating, but I think it looks a lot cooler if you sort of cut open the center and kind of tear it open and all the juices are gonna kind of stay in the parchment package. I think it's a lot nicer. I finished mine off with a little bit of fresh lemon. I made a really super light mustard aioli, just very, very light. And then because I did use mustard in the sauce, I topped with some micro red mustard greens. Anyway, there you go, salmon and parchment. Not only is it beautiful, not only is it delicious, it's actually really fun to make. And then there was nothing left to do except eat. Now I will admit, yours is gonna be better than mine because I took like 10 minutes to set up my last shot Mine was in the parchment like five minutes too long. So it was pretty much cooked through. There wasn't really any sort of, you know, pink in the middle like I generally like my salmon. But it was really, really good. Still very moist. Yours is going to be even better. So check out the blog post. I'm going to tell you how to get parchment paper. And then the rest is up to you. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts. And like I said, lots more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled garlic and herb shrimp. That's right, don't let the generic name fool you. This is one of the finest grilled seafood recipes in all the land. And since we just showed you how to plant your own herb garden, I thought we'd post a video that really illustrates how awesome it is to have those fresh herbs around. So let's go ahead and get started with the marinade, where we'll be using four of those herbs. We're gonna go with some basil, some oregano, and I have two kinds, Greek and Italian. And we're also gonna do some Italian parsley and some lemon thyme. 
Oh man, is that stuff good on grilled seafood. And above and beyond the fresh herbs and garlic, one of the real secrets to this recipe is to use a mortar and pestle to make the marinade. And I'll go into detail about this amazing tool on the blog. But for now, let's just go ahead and prep these herbs for processing. And all that's going to entail is taking the leaves off the stems, which is very easy for everything other than the thyme, which does take a minute or two to strip those little leaves off. And yes, when you first start your career as a prep cook in a kitchen, picking thyme leaves is one of the first jobs they give you, because everybody hates to do it. But it really isn't that bad, and when you taste these, the effort will be well worth it. So we'll go ahead and we'll pick our herbs, at which point we can move on to making the rest of this mixture. So first up, into the mortar, we're going to place some kosher salt, followed by just a little bit of lemon zest, and then more than a little sliced garlic. That was about three cloves. And what we'll do before we add our herbs is give this a little crushing first. So we'll grab the pestle and we'll give this the old smasha smasha. And we don't really need to go too fine. We just want to get this started. So go ahead and pound that until you have something that looks like this. And at this point, we can add in our herbs, but not like this. Very critical, we're going to have to cut them up a little bit first. Just start with the biggest basil leaves and kind of use those to wad everything together. And once we have a nice tight package, we can take a sharp knife and slice across this way. And then the other way. And we'll give that a little chop. And it may seem a little odd that we're chopping this before crushing it, but it only takes a couple seconds and really does work a lot better. So we will add in our herbs and we will give that a crushing. And I'm not going to stop the camera here, but at home, all that herb you see flying out, you're going to want to put back in. And I believe I mentioned earlier that the mortar and pestle is kind of key here, and it really is. While you can get something that looks similar to this with a food processor or a blender, you'll just never be able to achieve the same flavor. So in other words, if you want to crush this, you have to crush this. But anyway, we're going to crush those herbs into that garlic mixture until we have something pretty fine. I mean, we're not going for a total paste here, but basically something that looks like this. At which point we can add the last ingredient, the olive oil. But we're not going to add all of it. We're just going to start with a drizzle, and we'll mix that in first before adding the rest. And the reason is when you're working with a mortar and pestle, the rule of thumb is the thicker the mixture, the easier it is to crush. So we'll just start with a little splash, and we'll grind all that together for about a minute. And once it's been crushed to about this point, we can stop and add in the rest. And as you can see, I'm also switching to the freakishly small wooden spoon, and basically we're just adding in enough oil to achieve the proper thickness, which I think should be right about here. And believe it or not, that's it. Our garlic and herb marinade is done. So we'll set that aside while we go ahead and grab our shrimp. And what we have here is a couple pounds of peeled and deveined 1620s, which are the size I'm recommending here. And all 1620 means is that's how many come to a pound. So in my opinion for this recipe, the bigger the shrimp, the better. And at this point, we want to coat our shrimp with our herb mixture, but not all of it. We only want to add in two thirds at this point. We must save a third to finish the dish with. So we just want to transfer in about two thirds of that mixture. And then we'll grab a spoonula or something similar and give this a very, very thorough mixing. All right, shrimp are famous for their nooks and crannies. So you really do want to make sure you get in there and get in there good until these are all perfectly coated. And then once that's set, what we'll do is we'll transfer that into a plastic bag because we want to let these marinate in the fridge for at least a couple hours. And of course, you want to transfer this in carefully so you don't spill anything. Whoops. But anyway, we'll transfer that into a zip top bag and transfer that into the fridge for three hours. And what if you go for a little less or a little more? It'll probably be fine. And we will also wrap up that last third of that marinade because we're going to need that for later. Of course, plastic wrap does not stick to wood, which is why I like to steal those little shower caps from hotels and motels and use that instead. But that's another video. So like I said, we're going to let our shrimp marinade for about three hours at which point those are ready to skewer. And I will be using the metal ones for these, but some soaked bamboo skewers will also work. And we will use the standard once through the small part, once through the big part method, which is pretty basic. I would be lying if I said skewering shrimp was hard. And I'm gonna do four of these because apparently I only have four skewers. But don't worry, I'll cook those later. So our shrimp have been skewered, and at this point they're ready to cook. And I highly recommend you do that on a very, very hot charcoal grill. What about gas grills? Not a big fan. But anything hot will work. And the reason I want a very, very hot fire is because I'm going for some serious caramelization. Oh, well, I've never met a grill mark I didn't like. So a lot of grilled shrimp recipes recommend medium heat, but that is not me. I want very intense heat, very close to the shrimp. But anyway, I cooked those for a few minutes per side until they were just barely cooked through and looking awesome. At which point we'll pull those off the grill. And if everything's gone according to plan, you should be looking at one of the most beautiful platters of grilled shrimp you've ever seen. And at this point we're ready to serve, but wait, we have one last step to do. 
We have to take that third of the herb mixture we saved and use that to make a quick sauce to go over the top. So let's go ahead and transfer the rest of that mixture into a mixing bowl, to which we'll add some red pepper flakes. I'm using Aleppo pepper, but just red chili flakes will work. I'm also going to give it a little pinch of cayenne. You know that's good for you. As well as some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And one last drizzle of olive oil. Then we'll take a whisk and we'll give that a mix. And in just a few short seconds, you're going to be looking at a very gorgeous and incredibly delicious sauce to finish our shrimp with. So let's go ahead and spoon that over our shrimp, which as you can see have been transferred to a more geometrically appropriate platter. And we will spoon that over. And seriously, how good does that look? And then we finish these off with a few wedges of lemon. And right as I did, the light from the setting sun started being filtered through our neighbor's windblown tree, which caused the light to flicker, which when it comes to photography is a huge problem. But when it comes to everything else, the opposite of that. So I just went with it. And instead of being annoyed, I decided to enjoy it. So I went in for the official taste. And these really were magnificent. Just such a perfect combination with that sweet caramelized smoky shrimp, that fresh aromatic brightness of the herb, and of course a big punch of garlic. And obviously if you want to use some different herbs, go ahead. So things like dill or tarragon would also be beautiful in this. But of course that's up to you. You are the peaches of your herbs. So use whatever you like. But anyway, that's it. Grilled garlic and herb shrimp. So delicious, so simple, so easy. Especially if you have all those herbs growing for free in your backyard. All right? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Chapino. Finally, I'm doing San Francisco's official recipe. No, it's not rice aroni. It's Chapino, a spicy fish stew, which is basically fish cooked in a tomato and wine broth or sauce. Super easy. So we're going to take some olive oil and butter and saute on medium-low heat one onion and one rib of celery. So I cut the celery a little smaller. The onion's kind of in a large dice. And you want to cook that for about six, seven minutes until the onion softens. It gets a little bit golden, but you don't want to brown this, okay? I just threw a pinch of salt in there, which kind of helps things along. So there we go. About seven minutes later, approximately, the onions were, you know, getting a little soft. I'm going to throw in a lot of garlic. Chipino usually has a bunch of garlic in it. So I had about five cloves that I minced up fine. Cook that for about one minute. And then we're going to add two cups of a good white wine. Okay, something you would drink. Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, you know, white wine. All right, bring that to a simmer. I'm going to add a bay leaf, some dry oregano, and make sure you get all the exact ingredients on the site. And then some red pepper flakes. That's up to you. I used about a half teaspoon. I like it a little spicy. In fact, I put more later. A couple drops of Worcestershire sauce, and then our tomato product. You want three and a half cups of tomato. I've used sauce. I've used puree, which is what I'm using here. I've used crushed plum tomatoes. I've used diced tomatoes. In the summer, use fresh tomatoes. All right, almost anything works. If you use a tomato sauce, you know, it's got a little extra flavoring in there. Up to you. This is tomato puree. And then I washed out the can of tomato with about two cups of water. You can also use clam juice or fish stock. That would work great and give you a little extra flavor. But this is a very basic version I'm showing you here. All right, and then we're going to bring that up to a simmer. Turn it down to low and let that simmer for about 35 minutes to draw all the flavor out of the herbs and the bay leaf and the garlic and the onions. And while that's happening, we're going to get our seafood and other ingredients ready. I have five or six thin slices of lemon, about a half a cup of chopped herb. Okay, you can use all parsley, but I like a little bit of basil in there too if it's in season. All right, I'm going to use a pound of peeled and deveined shrimp, 12 ounces of any kind of white fish. That's cod, just cut in like one and a half inch pieces. I have some black mussels. That's one pound. And because I'm in San Francisco and I would be, you know, given a ticket if I didn't use it, one cooked, cracked Dungeness crab. You don't have to put it. Or if you're on the East Coast, use the blue crab, whatever. That's optional. Okay, our tomato wine mixture is ready. It's been cooking about 35 minutes. At this point, if you want it thinner, add some more fish stock or clam juice or water. I like mine a little bit thicker. Up to you. Put it on high heat. Bring it to a boil. First, add your lemon slices. By the way, you might be thinking, why lemon slices? The lemon rind gives it a little bit of a bitterness that, to me, brings out the sweetness. And it looks cool. We're also going to put in our white fish, our cod. And just bring that back to a simmer. 
It's only going to take about two minutes. When it starts bubbling again, I'm going to add my crab. Give that a stir. Once the crab is in, we're going to go ahead and put in the shrimp. And all this is only going to take about five minutes to finish. So the fish went in first with the lemon, then the crab, then the shrimp right here. On top of that, last but not least, the mussels. Make sure they're all kind of poked down into the sauce. Then you're going to cover tightly. Again, it's still on high heat. And boil that for five minutes. And then take a look and give it a stir. It might be done. It might need another minute. How do you know? All the mussels will open up and you will have a beautiful bubbling pot of chipino. Your fresh herb goes in at the end. All right, I'm using parsley. You could also put fresh tarragon in here. Really, I've never made this the same way twice, to be honest with you. So this is not the chipino recipe. This is a chipino recipe. Very important. Do not make things the same way twice. It's no fun. Taste for salt and pepper. All right, I put about a teaspoon of salt all together. That's just me. You're going to need to taste and adjust. Definitely adjust for hot pepper. I like it spicy. You might not. Spoon it out into a bowl. And by the way, that sourdough in the background was not a prop. You must eat this with sourdough bread dipped in it. It's the only way. It's really not chipino unless you eat it with sourdough. This would make a great special occasion recipe for a New Year's Eve party or anytime you want to kind of splurge a little bit. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. All the ingredients are on the site. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.